Hi, I'm Beth Battalino, CEO of Healthy Women. And on behalf of Healthy Women, Prevention, and the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, I want to welcome you to the final installment of our three-part webinar series, You and Your Brain. In previous sessions, we've focused on aging in your brain and navigating a dementia diagnosis. But today, we're gonna dive into promising advances in medicine and technology. For more than 30 years, Healthy Women has made it our mission to improve the lives of women and their loved ones. We're committed to helping women age smart and age well, and keeping your brain healthy at every age is so critical. Women make up two thirds of Alzheimer cases in the United States, and women of color are at an even higher risk for developing the disease. According to our Aging Smart, Aging Well survey with WebMD, dementia is one of the conditions women worry about the most, yet only 3% of women bring it up with their healthcare provider. That's why we need to have these conversations and why we are so glad to be working with prevention, which has such a long history of bringing together science and wellness and the women's Alzheimer's movement a true leader in this arena. Research in the field of brain health is booming and scientists are looking at innovation, innovative ways to approach Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. The approval of the first Alzheimer's drug in nearly 20 years demonstrates the significant need for treatment advances as well as new ways to approach brain health. And today, we are so fortunate to be discussing the latest research and the future of brain health with a panel of leading brain health experts. But first, I am so honored to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, a good friend to healthy women, Dr. John White. He's a physician and a writer who has been communicating to the public health issues of nearly two decades. He is currently the chief medical officer at WebMD, where he leads efforts to develop and expand strategic partnerships that create meaningful changes around important and timely public health issues. Prior to WebMD, Dr. White served as the Director of Professional Affairs and Stakeholder Engagement at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. He is board certified internist who continues to see patients we are so excited to have you here, Dr. White, and now I will turn the program over to you. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be with you. As you mentioned, I still see patients, so now I get to uh, ask all the questions they've been asking me to this wonderful panel of experts, and, and I'm really delighted to moderate today's webinar, The Future of Brain Health, and I wanna thank you in advance for joining for what I know is going to be an informative, an engaging conversation on this very important topic. So now it's my honor to introduce today's esteemed panelists. Dr. Sandra Bond Chapman is the founder and chief director of the Center for Brain Health and the D. Wiley Distinguished University Professor of Behavioral and Brain Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas. One of the nation's preeminent cognitive neuroscientist, Dr. Chapman is committed to enhancing human cognitive capacity and the underlying brain systems across the lifespan with more than 50 funded research grants, 200 publications, and a book, Make Your Brain Smarter. Dr. Chapman is defining, measuring, improving, and scaling brain health fitness protocols to reach people around the world. Dr. Chapman is also the co-creator of the Brain Health Project, a collaboration with 30 of the world's leading brain health experts focused on harnessing the brain's potential to lengthen and strengthen its functionality. Welcome, Dr. Chapman. It's great to be here. Dr. Richard Isaacson is the director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, assistant dean of faculty development, and associate professor of neurology at the Wild Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian. 
Dr. Isaacson specializes in Alzheimer's disease risk reduction and treatment, mild cognitive impairment, and preclinical disease. He has published novel methods on using a precision medicine approach in real world clinical practice of Alzheimer's risk reduction. He led the development of Alzheimer's Universe, a vast online education research portal on Alzheimer's disease with a clinical practice, focus on lifestyle interventions, and a broad background in computer science, mHealth, biotechnology, and web development, Dr. Isaacson is committed to using technology to optimize patient care, risk assessment, and early intervention. Welcome, Dr. Isaacson. Great. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. And Karen Jones, she's the president and CEO of the National Caucus and Center on Black Aging based in Washington, DC. NCBA is the largest minority focused aging organization recognized as the leader in senior housing, employment, health and advocacy on behalf of minority seniors. Prior to this, Ms. Jones was elected and served eight years as a state representative in the Texas legislature representing San Antonio. Ms. Jones currently serves on the national boards of directors for Alzheimer's Association, Generations United, Center for Innovation, Leading Age, and she is the immediate past chair of the board for the American Society on Aging. She's also an adjunct professor at Stetson University School of Law, Gulfport, Florida. Welcome, Ms. Jones. Thank you, it's great to be here. And it's great to see all of you. We're gonna get right to it. And my first question is, can you help explain how has brain science evolved over the past 20 years and even the past five years. And, and I need to ask you, do you agree with the premise that now's actually a booming time for brain research? We're gonna go with ladies first, if we may. So I'm gonna start off with Dr. Chapman. So absolutely. I think what's so exciting for me as a cognitive neuroscientist We've learned more about the brain's amazing capacity to be rewired in the last five years than all the years cumulative. And it's a lot because of our fancy brain imaging that's allowing us to see the brain change in real time as people go from being a novice to an expert. So absolutely, the research to know that we can prevent so much of what's going on, but really strengthen our brain starting young, you know, 10 years old, 20 years old, you know, and not wait till what I call right of doom till something bad happens. So it is a burgeoning area. And every one of us, you know, I th think about this, John, um, brain health was such a new concept in 1999. I've got a trademark on it mm -hmm. uh, because people weren't even talking about the brain in health because it's still seen as a black box. So absolutely. It is a major area of scientific exploration that needs to be translated today. And, and Karen, how, how do you feel about the changes that have occurred in, in the last few years, particularly? Well, obviously, I'm very excited about the potential uh, and all of the new research and all of the new possibilities. Um, unfortunately, and I, I appreciate the fact that I'm uh, included with these wonderful experts who understand the brain a whole lot better than I do. Uh, I'm more on the grassroots side uh, as an advocate for uh, health. And so we cannot uh, move forward without understanding that in communities of color, there's a higher risk of incidence of Alzheimer's and other dementia, which stems from a variety of medical conditions uh, all either health related or socioeconomic risk factors. And so I'm just hoping that all of this good information uh, will obviously move us all forward, but that we take into consideration that there are people, particularly people of color, who may not benefit as much from this because they come with so many other issues that affect their cognitive health. And we're gonna come back to that because in many years, it hasn't changed over the past five or 20 years. Richard, I, I wanna ask you, what's different today than 10 years ago or 20 years ago? What has changed? The science, the understanding, 
of the disease? Is it that much different? Is it availability of research dollars? What's the difference? Well, the saying it takes a village, um, it's taken a village to get us to this point from advocates to cognitive neuroscientists to, I'm, I'm a clinician, I see patients and, and we all have to work together. It's, it's this group moving the needle forward and, and pushing, pushing the ball down the field. And in the last 20 years, I mean, things are completely different. When I was in medical school, we didn't even understand that Alzheimer's disease, as one example, the most common form of dementia begins in the brain decades before the first symptom of memory loss began. We didn't know that. We, when a person had dementia, we thought the disease started then. Nope. Alzheimer's disease starts 20 to 30 years, sometimes more potentially, before the first symptom of memory loss. So in 20 years, everything's changed completely. About a decade ago, the diagnostic criteria changed. So when a doctor talks to a patient, just for the first time, we realized that starting early, those mild symptoms, the, the early symptoms, pre-dementia, before the person can no longer take care of themselves, now we recognize that's a part of the disease and maybe we can treat that. Maybe we can do something about it. We didn't even know that before that. And in the last five years, like, like Dr. Chapman said, things are completely different. Um, there's been a fast forwarding of progress. Um, you know, I'm, I take a very biological and genetic and precision medicine based approach at our patients. And I mean, what I do even a year or two ago is, is completely different. I take such a deep dive look at a patient and I, we try now to truly understand why that person may be on the road to dementia, maybe on the road to, to declines in cognitive function. And we can precisely you know, begin to identify these paths and then individualize management. So I guess what I would say is everything's totally different now. Um, the, the whole field has changed and I couldn't personally from a biological and management and treatment perspective, I couldn't be any more hopeful. Now we're, we're on really good um, a path. Well, I wanna dig a little deeper into this issue of diagnosis and prevention. And in, in, in some ways, there's similarities to cancer. And a big change in cancer care was the discovery of biomarkers. How have biomarkers been involved with Alzheimer's disease? And, and maybe we even take a step back, if we can, Rich, and explain to our audience, what are biomarkers as we talk about you know, brain disease? <coughs> And how are they used perhaps in the diagnosis and detection of Alzheimer's disease? Great, so I think most of us are familiar with getting cholesterol tests when we go to the doctor and we get that every year, or every six months. A lot of us are familiar, we get a blood check and we look at blood sugar. And if the blood sugar is high or the cholesterol is high, that person is at a higher risk to have a heart attack or a stroke or another problem with their vascular system. And we wanna prevent that, so we do these tests beforehand. Alzheimer's disease biomarkers are quite similar. Now, currently um, we use scans, brain scans, something called a PET scan. Uh, we can actually look for a biomarker, which is a, a characteristic finding on a scan that denotes a disease. So for example, amyloid can be found on a PET scan. We can do spinal taps, meaning you get some fluid, it's called a lumbar puncture. We can look for the amyloid protein, the tau protein. These are proteins that get gunked up and build up in the brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease, for example. However, where we're going is blood tests. Within 12 to 18 months, I really believe this, this is the future of, of our field, we're gonna be doing blood tests, just like we get cholesterol tests with HDLs and LDLs and triglycerides. We're gonna be getting amyloid, tau, neurofilament light. We're gonna be getting these blood biomarkers to screen before a person has symptoms or if a person is just developing symptoms. So really we're, we're witnessing a total transformation in the field of, of dementia, prevention care, risk reduction for dementia, and a biomarker is something that we can detect before a problem happens or as the problem is just starting to make an accurate diagnosis. Sandy, do we know um, with some degree of certainty how well biomarkers correlate either with severity of disease or perhaps uh, susceptibility to different treatment strategies? Are we there yet or do we need more research? You know, I, I as a scientist, uh, we always say we need more research. Yeah. Right? Well, I always say that, but <laughs> do we have enough now? But, no, you know, I think that what we're looking for, as uh, Rich said, is these early markers and some of the things we're looking at is brain energy metabolism so even we know, for example, even poor sleep causes that disruption, and it may be one of the early triggers that later 
signals this uh, beta amyloid and tau. But, you know, if we treat it early, absolutely, there are some ways to reverse that. So it's not like, oh my gosh, you've got this biomarker or you've got beta amyloid, because we also know that there's a certain amount of that in the brain that's needed to stay healthy. You know, as some of our drugs have told us, getting rid of all of the amyloid plaque doesn't necessarily associate with cognitive well-being. So that's why this whole field of brain health is so complex and multifaceted. And we need to approach it from a very proactive, preventive okay. approach rather than just either you have or you don't. So the biomarkers, the genetics, you know, we're now learning a lot about epigenetics. And as we're tracking people, how much you can change this kind of predisposition is pretty transformative for people genetics changing control. yeah epigenetics changing our genes is we, yes. we could spend a whole nother hour yes. on that but you know the other key issue is detection how do we diagnose this early so perhaps through screening the role of biomarkers but there's still the role of cognitive testing and you know i mentioned before we got on i still see patients and you know are, where are we sandy in terms of cognitive testing are are we still asking patients to do serial sevens count you know backwards draw a clock and then you know tell me show me it's it's three o'clock and i always get confused myself on spelling world backwards so where <laughs> so viewers can start to do that right now but where are we on cognitive testing have we made progress in terms of new methods where, where are we sandy you know i think that's an area that we've made a lot of progress for example at at brain health and this global brain health project that we're launching is developing much more complex measures than the ones that you're talking mm -hmm. about screening because we know many people uh, pass those tests at very high levels but still have some of the early signs as rich was talking about we want early detection it's really more our complex thinking, our innovation, and not so much our memory, because everyone, even my college students talk about memory problems, that it's much more complex than that. So absolutely, we, ha we are developing a lot more uh, sophisticated cognitive measures. And I think as we began to track people over time, you know, John, if you lose some capacity versus I lose yeah. capacity, it's going to be me against me, not me against you. So that's one of the biggest changes I think that's happening is that people begin to embrace, oh my gosh, I can hardly wait to see, have I gained capacity or lost capacity? And let me be proactive yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Rich, what are you using when a patient comes in to you and says, I'm concerned? I mean, and they don't usually say I'm concerned about my brain health. You know, they say I'm, I'm getting forgetful or perhaps a caregiver, a caregiver gives in, comes in a spouse and says, I'm a little worried about them. They, they seem to have lost a step. What's your cognitive testing strategy? Sure. So, well, in an ideal world, I'd actually love to see people before they have symptoms. Um, if I have a person with memory loss or dementia and they have a family member, a child, a daughter or son, for example, th those are the people that I'd like to treat because I'd like to really start early. But whether a person has symptoms or not, if someone is coming to me to, to try to diagnose their symptoms and be on a treatment plan, or if someone is coming in to say, doc, is there anything I can do to reduce my risk or slow slow any potential progression to dementia that I may get in 10 or 20 years? I'm gonna do the same thing. And I try to keep it simple. Um, and the simple paradigm that we um, talk about and we've published on is called the ABCs of Alzheimer's prevention management and Alzheimer's management. So the ABCs, we think of it as a triangle. The A is called anthropometrics. That's a big word for body composition. And the body composition means what is a person's weight? What is their body fat? What is their muscle mass? What is their waist circumference? For example, I think many people don't know women that have increased levels of belly fat, visceral fat, which is fat around the organs, they're at a 39% higher risk of dementia. So belly fat, as the belly size gets larger, the memory center in the brain gets smaller. And this is specifically true for a unique risk factor for women. So we want to understand that. We want to measure these things and we want to track over time. The other really important thing is the B, blood-based biomarkers or B for blood tests. Uh, B includes cholesterol tests, 
tests of metabolism like blood sugar, hemoglobin A1C, um, insulin. Um, we look at tests for inflammation in the blood. And then we also look at nutritional markers. Um, you know, there are certain things that people can eat that can actually be protective against um, uh, cognitive decline. And there are other things people eat that can be harmful. We also look at some genetics. Um, I won't get too into the genetics, but that's definitely part of the B. And then finally, the C, um, cognitive function. So just like uh, Dr. Chapman said, cognitive function. We mean to test cognitive function, and we do that in our program. We use computer-based cognitive testing. That's about two-thirds of our battery. Uh, we use something called the NIH toolbox. It feels kind of like activities or games, but what they're really doing is truly assessing cognitive function. And then we do the traditional pen and paper tests, uh, memory tests, um, and drawing figures and things like that. Um, the other thing that we're, I think we're going towards is using um, you know, passive monitoring. So for example, we have a program where all of our patients get, get one of these things and we can track their sleep we can track their exercise we can track i get an apple watch i get a fitbit what is that it's something like that yeah, it's, it's a it's a separate it's a separate thing and i have nothing to disclose i have no uh, no commercial affiliation to anything but um we actually i have a dashboard that i can look at on my phone mm -hmm. and i can see how people are, are tracking and one of our studies showed that depending on these measures that can actually predict mm -hmm. a person's cognitive function without even doing a cognitive test. So the take home point here is we track a lot of data. We, when someone says I have a problem or not, we're gonna do a baseline assessment and then we're gonna follow these numbers over time every six months to evaluate whether the things that we're telling a person to do to reduce their risk or protect mm -hmm. or improve their memory is actually working. Yeah. You mentioned genetics. I, I wanna follow up real quickly on that because I'm sure uh, some members of the audience are thinking, okay, my father died of dementia, how does that impact my risk? Yeah, so um, do we have two hours for this or three no, hours? No, that's why I said uh, quickly. Okay. I knew, I knew it's complicated. Yeah. So but genetics are complicated. Let me just start by saying, um, you know, genes are not your destiny. We can win the tug of war against your genes in many cases and even most cases, but not every case. Certain people have have genes, but it's a, it's a very rare, small number where if you get a gene that that basically causes Alzheimer's, the person's gonna get Alzheimer's. The good news is, is that's a very small percentage, 1%. There's other genes out there that can increase your risk or decrease your risk. The most common genetic variant that I think people have talked about, because you can order the tests at home, um, is called APOE. APOE, uh, you get a two, a three, or a four from mom or dad. Sorry, this is confusing, but if you have one four variant or two copies of the four variant, then you have a higher risk. It doesn't mean you're gonna get Alzheimer's disease though. Genetics are really important from my perspective because depending if a person has an APOE4 or not, I'm going to give them different recommendations, different management options. Depending on if they have other genes that we may find, I'm going to maybe personalize their care even more. This is common in cancer care. As you mentioned earlier, you find a gene and you're going to give a specific treatment targeted for that gene. And in terms of the future of, of dementia care, that's how we're going to uh, manage. Um, one more final thing on genes. Again, genes are not your destiny. Um, having an ApoE4 variant, for example, is more impactful in a negative way for women. So it may be something we need to think about. Um, women, as they age, especially if they have the ApoE4 variant, they may be at higher risk. Mm -hmm. However, it's complicated. African American women with an ApoE4 variant may not be as as much as as a, as a, as a, at a high risk compared to Caucasian women, for example. So, the the complexity with genetics is um, it's 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 new. We need to do more research, and each person you have to in, you know, kind of interpret their genetic um, uh, changes within their their own individual context. So, I want to bring Karen in. Karen, we're hearing about these fancy lab tests that we can do, some genetic testing, you know, a whole bunch of cognitive testing, measuring, you know, visceral fat. But we know for communities of color, they often don't have access or they often don't have dementia, you know, high on their list of, of, of issues. So what's the impact on communities of color and how do we address some of these issues when we're talking about, we can't treat dementia and Alzheimer's if we don't first diagnose it and we have to get them into the system. Well, I'm always excited to hear about all the advances and the innovations that are going on in terms of addressing Alzheimer's and dementia. I think we all have a silent fear. I remember my father, before he passed away, he said, he's so glad 
He said, I would rather lose a limb than lose my mind. Mm -hmm. And so we all care about our brain health. And so I'm, I'm always excited to hear that. I don't want to sound like the Grim Reaper, but as part of my job in trying to educate and make my community aware of these opportunities for this kind of um, research and, and treatment, uh, we have to go back and look, unfortunately, at um, and acknowledge uh, that the social environment in terms of disparities, uh, quality of education, higher rates of poverty, uh, the greater exposure to adversity and discrimination, all imposed by structural racism. And I know everyone's tired of it, but it has such an impact on overall health particularly mm -hmm. how it impacts brain health. And so it, we have to, um, we focus on trying to change all of those disparities to at least assist that, but we make sure that our communities get more information so that they're made aware of the uh, symptoms early on. And then also we work to make sure that in the medical profession, they are diagnosed at an earlier rate. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. And I'm hoping that all of this exciting information on, on new treatments uh, can certainly reach all people uh, so that we can move ahead past this devastating disease. But as you work with your colleagues, I mean, I find this in some um, patients of color that I see, dementia is not top on their list. It's I'm concerned about diabetes. I'm concerned about hypertension. And you know, I know someone with kidney disease, they tell me, or I'm concerned about a heart attack. They often don't say dementia and Alzheimer's to the same degree that Caucasian patients might. Have you found that too in, in your work? And how do we change that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we we certainly have to deal with what's you know where the pain is first, uh, and then you know we we are still learning. Uh, and and I always have to preface this by saying that African Americans, along with other racial and ethnic groups, are not monolithic. And so there are many of us who've had fortunate opportunities, and we're quite aware of the of dementia, its potential in terms of treatment, all of those things. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of the larger percentage of people, no, they're worried about their diabetes. They're worried about cardiovascular. And then, you know, we're gonna talk about stress and what stress does to the brain. And on average, we all have a lot of stress, but there's an added stress uh, on people of color in that they have to deal with issues of discrimination and racism. And that has a major, you know, focus on it. So no, our first priority is, of course, getting our cholesterol and, and heart disease, but we've got all these other socio, other factors that play into it. Quality of life, um, lack of education, uh, food deserts. I mean, it goes on and on that we have to address as a society so that we see an improvement in people's overall health. And you talk about the impact of stress on the brain. Something I've always found fascinating is the ability of the brain to change. And that's not the case of everything in our body. So Sandy, you're, I see you smiling. You know, there, there's this, you know, big word, neuroplasticity, which is a fundamental concept in the diagnosis and treatment of dementia. So explain to our audience what we mean by neuroplasticity and what role it plays as, as we talk about brain health. So I think that neuroplasticity is probably the greatest gift that the human design has at its disposal is this ability to change your brain by how you think, how you feel when you sleep, uh, your emotions, your social cognition. And uh, John, and you were talking about stress. One of the things that we've developed with neuroplasticity is how can individuals begin to embrace the amazing potential of the brain to be strengthened? We've shown people 50 years and older, healthy people, regain almost two decades back of their neural health in terms of brain blood flow, connectivity, cortical thickness, by teaching them how to think better and embrace sort of this gift of neuroplasticity 
Rather than just accept aging, I you know, remember what caused the cognitive decline is healthy people letting their brain decline that starts in our 20s in health. So being able to be preventive, take advantage of this, but neuroplasticity also means negatively mm. our brain changes by the toxic things we're doing. So it's not all good. I mean, our brain changes if we don't sleep. If you don't sleep, if you didn't sleep last night, you wake up the next morning, man, your brain's not as efficient as it was. It, negative plasticity is how people respond to stress, just traumatic stress. We also see it with multitasking and constant distractions. So neuroplasticity is a good thing, but it's also important to realize that we lose capacity by how we use our brain. So it's this amazing ability of your brain to change moment by moment. Now, you mentioned in our 20s, our, our brain health, we, uh, I, I'm going to paraphrase, so tell me if I'm simplifying it. You know, we lose brain cells, but we have billions of them. Do brain cells regenerate? That's to you, Sandy. Oh, it's back to me. Good. Yeah. Do brain yes. cells regenerate? But yes, there is evidence that the brain cells can regenerate in the hippocampus with exercise um, and that we can see those. You know, what we're more interested in is the connectivity. So more doesn't always mean better. So what are they doing and how are they using it? And what is the part of it? Absolutely, we get new brain cells. We improve connectivity. Uh, as we age, you know, we when people say, what's your peak brain years? Most people say it's 10 years younger than they are now. Mm -hmm. So I say, don't you wish it was 10 years ahead of you? And it yeah. can be. All right, I'm going to find out how I get to that point 10 years from now. <laughs> but first, I want to ask Rich, you know, sometimes advocates will say you've seen one patient with Alzheimer's, you've seen one patient with Alzheimer's, meaning there's a wide range of presentation and uh, response to treatment. It needs to be very personalized. And you referenced early on about precision medicine and personalized medicine. Is that a fair assessment? that example of you see one, you've only seen one? Yeah, you know, I, I say that a lot and uh, I want to qualify. Maybe I heard it from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. So I, I say I say that a lot. So good, good, good quote, you, you're, you're hired. Um, but I also want to qualify it because, you know, I would say about 50% or more of patients with Alzheimer's are pretty similar. Um, but these idiosyncrasies are really important. And I, I have four family members with Alzheimer's. I can tell you my uncle Bob was totally different uh, than my dad's first cousin, Charlotte. Like they just different, well, different, different sexes, right? Male, man versus woman. That's actually very important. And I had no idea about the differences when I first learned this, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Now I understand they had different vascular risk factors. You know, my, my uncle Bob, he smoked, he, um, you know, didn't live as healthy of a lifestyle. Um, so, so I think different people can be on different roads to Alzheimer's and different people with dementia can present and behave very differently. So I completely agree with that. And it's truly from a preventative standpoint, from a risk factor management perspective, different people, in my opinion, can take different roads to Alzheimer's disease. So for example, some people may be on the road where they have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and maybe that doesn't cause Alzheimer's per se, but it can fast forward dementia and it can fast forward Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and at least one out of every three people that have Alzheimer's have a mixed dementia where they have these vascular uh, issues as well and that changes things. So I guess what I would say is um, men and women can be on different roads. People with different medical issues can be on different roads. People with different genetics can be on different roads. And if you really follow patients, you know, I'm a clinician like you, John, and I, 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 I follow patients so closely and People present differently. They talk differently. They can manage during their day-to-day day -day lives differently. And it's, I really believe that management should likely need to be tailored differently depending on how the person presents um, you know, to a physician. Yeah. Well, I want to dig a little deeper into the sex differences. And Sandy, I, I want to ask you, what are the differences we see in Alzheimer's disease risk as well as treatment as it relates to men versus women. And, and I just wanna reflect on and have you comment on, when I see patients um, with dementia, the men are usually with their spouse who says he's having problems. I, I don't see it as often perhaps 
in, in women the other way around. Is, is that a fair assessment in, in terms of, you know, is it is it occurring earlier in men than women? Are women not just being diagnosed as often as they should? What's going on here as it relates to men versus women in terms of Alzheimer's disease risk and treatment? You know, I think we're trying to understand a lot of the female differences that may make them at greater risk. For a long time, it was believed, for example, that women uh, had greater risk mainly because they lived longer. Well, we now know that's not true because even at 60, we see that the incidence is higher. You know, and some thought, well, it's some of the things that Karen was talking about, the educational opportunities and the job that the things that builds this cognitive reserve. But it looks like it's much more complex than that. You know, is it the socioeconomic factors of them juggling so many things? I think that, you know, I'm just really glad that we're starting to study it. Um, one of the things that we have found, and we've worked with probably a thousand uh, different individuals with mild cognitive impairment with Alzheimer's disease, we see that women actually are more likely to sign up to see can they benefit from cognitive training. Um, and they're also, as caregivers, uh, while they're at greater risk, they're also more likely to realize, hey, I want to take up the mantle of this increased burden that I'm doing and do something about it. So, you know, some of the genetic risk factors, the biological factors, uh, we're working with Dr. Lisa Moscone and trying to understand some of that. I think, you know, as we follow women long term to see what's prevented, I'm, I'm really excited about the potential of estrogen, hormone replacement, really treat women in a different way, but individual women as well. Do we think estrogen's protective in the development of Alzheimer's disease or, or we don't know? I think it's a mixed bag, right? At first it was thought to be and now it's not. And so things just uh, seem like they get flipped in terms of estrogen being protective uh, for individuals. So again, I think it's it's not one size fits all. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of people are tuned in because they want to know what can they do to prevent Alzheimer's dementia? What's the role of lifestyle. So I'm gonna start with you, Rich, and, and this is what everybody wants to know. I wanna know it. What do I need to be eating? How much exercise do I need to do? Do I have to do Sudoku? Like what 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 do I need to be doing? Can you, Karen and I are thinking, we gotta go do crossword puzzles later. What, rank them for me. <laughs> Making it tougher for you. Can't do everything. Yeah. So, so the, good, the good news is, I wanna keep it simple for everybody. Okay. I have you this like magic. Again. Yeah. Well, I have this magic pill, and if you take this magic pill, no, I'm just kidding. So, unfortunately, I've seen uh, those commercials, Rich. We'll come back. I, to that. I okay. know. Yes. Yeah. So, what, what do we need to be doing? Yeah. So, so first of all, um, so there's no one size fits all approach. Let's start by saying that. But there's a lot of things that help many people. So let's let's just be let's just mm -hmm. start with that. Um, the first thing a person needs to do is breathe and take a deep breath because um, when you think about brain health and you think about all the potential options and you think about all the, what should I do this? I saw this commercial. What should I talk to my doctor? I think it can be overwhelming for a lot of people. So I think the first thing, take a deep breath, um, then talk to your doctor. Um, it sounds silly. You know, talk to your doctor, doctor saying, talk to your doctor, right? Well, talk to your doctor and just get the general medical evaluation for things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. Um, the amount of patients that come to see me that have high blood pressure and they're taking a pill and then they take their blood pressure and their pressures are still 140s, 150s, over 80s to 90s, that is still high blood pressure. Um, you know, There's research that shows in a randomized study called the Sprint Mind Study that if you, even if you get your blood pressure down from the 140s over 80s to the 120s over 70s or below, you can reduce your likelihood of developing these mild cognitive impairment, the early signs of cognitive decline by 19% just by changing one risk factor and that's blood pressure. So I'm, I, I'm giving you one specific example because it's such, a, it's such a, a really important one, but every single person out there needs to understand their own individual risk factors. The first way to do that, talk to a doctor. The second thing, 
Know your numbers. Everyone out there should know their blood pressure, their blood sugar, their waist circumference, their weight. People should know all these things. And I, I know I don't like getting on a scale, I don't, but I do it. I do it and I track it. And my, my, my body fat scale tells me um, how I'm doing and it, 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 it helps me track things. So those are some of the initial things. Um, I think about um, lifestyle interventions as exercise is about the most important thing on the planet that any person can do for brain health. Walking is better than nothing. Walking for 20, 30 or 40 minutes is better than five or 10 minutes. Um, but the real optimal exercise plan should be a mix. Strength training at least two or at least twice a week. I think many people skip that. Cardiovascular training, you know, maybe pushing it a little bit more. People, for example, with the APOE4 variant, that genetic risk factor, may need to push it a little more. We recommend high intensity interval training a couple times a week. And then steady state cardio, getting your heart rate at, a, at about a 60 to 65% of its maximum. You know, for me, it's, a, it's in the low 110s and keeping it there for 30 to 45 minutes at least several times a week. You can do that on a brisk walk or on a bicycle, whatever it is. So, having a targeted approach to exercise, mm -hmm. eating a Mediterranean style diet, uh, fatty fish like mackerel, lake trout, mm -hmm. wild salmon, um, sardines, um, albacore tuna in, in low amounts. These are things that can be brain healthy. Um, making sure people get adequate sleep. Um, exercise can loosen up that amyloid, but mm -hmm. sleep, you need, you need to really make a plan for sleep. Burning the candle at both ends, five, six hours a night, you can't do it. At least seven, seven and a half hours, could try to make good quality time for sleep. Stress management, keeping the brain engaged, um, whether you learn something new, a new language, uh, musical instruments. I learned all about cryptocurrency last week and I'm losing my shirt in Bitcoin. So don't don't learn about Bitcoin. Let's skip that one. That that didn't work for me. Now I'm learning how to maybe- I, I could have told you that, Rich. No, Thank you. So, that. So, so be careful. Some of the things you learn may not be good. So don't check the Bitcoin today. Um, the, the moral of the story here is there is no one magic pill. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there are things that people can do, whether it's managing cholesterol with pills. Some people, you know, we do use vitamin uh, supplementation for if they have low vitamin levels. Um, this is a very complex topic, but there's a lot you can do. Okay. That's, that's the biggest, yeah. biggest take home. I'm sure people are focused on the sardines. I don't know how many people are eating sardines, but people do want to know, do we have good data on things like learning another language? You mentioned that, or, you know, reading more often or, doing crossword puzzles. Sandy, do we have data on that, that that works too? Or is that just things people should do them if they enjoy them, but if they don't, you know, not necessarily take them up? So, yes, we do have very strong data. We have almost 600 randomized trials now showing that cognitive training is one of the strongest ways to build a brain. But it's really important to think about what it is that you use. And, and in the last two years, based on 30 years of research, we've developed, we're, try, we're trying to get people to remove the stigma from their brain. Because right now, if the whole audience, if I said to everyone, hey, you know, in 30 minutes, you're going to take a brain test, like, whoa, no, not me, not now, I'm not ready. Because we have so much stigma. We don't embrace the potential of our brain. So a brain health index really looks more holistically like a single number that takes down all of the factors that we're talking about, complex cognition, social bonding, uh, the stress management of mental health, as well as some of the daily life thing like exercise and nutrition, puts it together because mm -hmm. people are productive in their lives for very different factors and we want to know holistically where are you. Now, in terms of the specificity that you're asking, the brain, whatever you practice is what your brain gets better at. So I tell people, if you love crossword puzzles and you want to get better and better at crossword puzzles, then keep doing them. Does yeah. it make you better in terms of your real life functionality and the complexity of what you're tackling? Mm, probably not. That's going to require deeper level thinking constantly and innovative thinking. Okay. Those are the things that we see that really pushes the needle for people to really improve their cognitive reserve and also their brain capacity. And also one of the big things, you know, anxiety since COVID mm -hmm. uh, has really been astronomical. For college students, for millennials, for 50 year olds, mm -hmm. every age 
person and people of color and particularly people in low SES groups. Mm -hmm. Just by managing anxiety, confidence building is the antidote for anxiety. Okay. And that's one of the things that we, as a person, individuals can learn and change their holistic brain health in a very significant way, just by improving their confidence. And that's what one of our partners, for example, has a book on, how does confidence work to change the brain and your neuropharmacy? Okay. Well, what about some of these other non-tangential elements? You mentioned, you know, confidence, but, you know, some people say it's the power of purpose. People who are purposeful mm -hmm. live longer, or this concept of yeah. resilience or fortitude. Do we have good data around that, or are those just, you know, good things to do? So that, that's what's so exciting. We just finished a pilot study uh, for this. We're going to enroll 120,000 healthy people from ages 10 to 100 and follow them every year to do the trainings. And what we first discovered, the data showed mm -hmm. three factors that contributed holistically to making me more robust. Mm -hmm. One was clarity of thinking, and it wasn't the way that we had predicted. We mm -hmm. started off thinking that it would be cognitive, social, real life functionality, exercise, nutrition, and then psychological well-being, but it didn't turn out to be that. So we found that the factors of these 31 measures of these individuals pre and post testing and training, the first one is clarity, which is kind of this ability to see things deeper, to innovate. Mm -hmm. But when people had improved clarity in this period of time, their sleep got better, their compassion got mm -hmm. better, as well as their ability to be optimistic. So clarity was a big factor. The second that you mentioned was resilience tended to help this holistic brain health mm -hmm. And resilience was this ability to develop deep social bonds. People that have uh, deep relationships, and it doesn't have to be a lot, but someone that you can count on, and then also purpose was part of this resilience. People can overcome a lot when they have a sense of purpose and help their holistic brain health index. And the third one was fortitude. And that was the ability to kind of be able to know that you could weather the storm to find moments of joy and to see that. So those three factors were the things that we found uh, that help people's holistic brain health index to get better. So absolutely, we're interested in motivating people from a proactive mm -hmm. point of view rather than just fear point okay. of view. Karen, I, I want to get your thoughts on these lifestyle changes. Rich told us we should, you know, eat fruits and vegetables. We should eat all these different types of fish. We need to exercise. We need to sleep. But many people will say that can be hard to do when you're on limited income. Fruits and vegetables and fish can be expensive. It's not easy to sleep seven to nine hours a night if you've got two jobs and, you know, decrease your stress. There's only so many limits of in the day, so many hours in the day. Are these practical for, and it's not for all, as you said, it's not all communities of colors, but particularly those that are socially disadvantaged. How do we help them institute these lifestyle changes, which we know can reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's? Well, I don't know if it's about practical, but in terms of realistic, we know that that's not possible for a large percentage of the population. Um, and so I, I hate to always be the grim reaper after we hear all these wonderful uh, uh, messages on, on how advanced and how we are moving forward in terms of addressing these things with brain health. But there's still the reality that so many people don't have the advantage. I mean, we still have food deserts, food deserts. That means they don't have the option of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, we, you know, I've already mentioned stress. We have a different kind of stress. And really and truly, when we talk about resilience, I don't know of a people more resilient than African Americans and what we have endured and where we continue to endure. So I know that it sounds like you're always talking about these things, but if you want to see an improvement in the quality of life of people where they understand how important these things are to their health, particularly their brain health. 
Uh, we still have to do so much more awareness and education, and we have to address the issues that then create barriers for them to be able to have the optimal cognitive health. So, you know, we're going to keep working on that aspect. I'm going to keep encouraging the research, uh, the clinicians to continue to work to um, seek hopefully a cure from this. Uh, but we still have a whole lot to do so that we can prevent those things. Karen, your organization is based in Washington, D.C. What are the policy issues that need to be brought up or what are the changes to break down these barriers? Is this something that the federal government needs to do? Is it is it more at the state level or at the community level? You know, what needs to be done to get rid of food deserts or to have a built environment where people can safely, you know, walk outside or, you know, is it issues of wages? What What's the, you know, top two or three policy priorities that you think need to be implemented to address some of these issues in terms of being able to utilize these lifestyle changes that, that can be so important? Well, beyond just valuing all human beings equally, uh, I'd like to see, uh, just like Dr. Isaacson said earlier, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take a village. It's going to take advocates and grassroots organizations like mine to continue to educate communities on their health and how to have better health. It's going to take researchers to have uh, clinical trials that are diverse and include all kinds of people so that we can get to how we address individuals with their uh, brain health. Uh, it's going to take uh, clinicians to recognize and, and just make sure that there's no implicit or explicit bias in treating a patient. Uh, and so there, it's going to take a village. And in terms of all of us working together, we then influence policymakers and legislators and appropriators uh, to make sure that the funding is there to support the research and the treatment and caregiving uh, to support communities so that we can really address this issue effectively because mm -hmm. it's very costly uh, when you have, have Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, it, it is a very costly disease. So we're trying to address those things. And of course, our ultimate goal is just to make sure we have a healthy society. Rich, you mentioned early on that ideally you'd like to see people in their 20s. Uh, to talk about it. But some people in the audience might be thinking, I'm already in my 50s or in my 60s or maybe in the 70s. Is there a point when lifestyle changes aren't really going to make that much of a difference in Alzheimer's disease prevention, maybe in some other conditions, but not in terms of your brain? So I, I'm going to react. I'm going to say, I'm going to respond with one simple thing. It's never too late. Um, I think someone can make a change today, right now. You can plan for it tomorrow, but why not just make the change today and have that small but incrementally positive impact on brain health over time? Whether it's cognitive training, whether it's exercise, whether it's you know taking a walk, whether it's taking a deep breath to de-stress. Um, there are certain things that basically anyone can do right now with. with, with you know, as, as low cost as possible, but but granted, there there are many people that are not able to do much of this. I think anyone can do it. Um, you know, we actually have um, research that have tried to look into answering this question. We see people. Uh, we started people seeing people forty and above, up, and then we went to thirty and up, and now we're at twenty five and above. Um, we haven't seen anyone younger, but who knows that we, that that may that may be on the docket at some point. Um, you know, for example, the Women's Alzheimer's Movement um, funded a study to try to look at in our in our work in our clinic. Um, is there an age difference? Is there a, a sex difference? Do women versus men respond differently to these lifestyle interventions? And one of the studies we published so far, um, it did show that people aged 61 and lower um, did respond better uh, and more, maybe more robustly, but people above the age of 61 still responded. It just took them a little bit more time. Um, you know, and now what we're doing is, and we haven't published this yet, so I won't talk about it, but you know, what are the sex differences? Women versus men of different ages, women during the perimenopause transition, you know, do they respond as robustly? What about women with the APOE4 variant? So what, I, what, what I'm going to say is anyone at, at any age today, right now, can make a commitment to, to make a positive change. That being said, there are idiosyncrasies. There are some genetic and sex differences and age differences. You just need to maybe wait a little bit longer for that, you know, mm -hmm result, but in theory, based on the evidence, it still should happen. Okay. 
Sandy, what about those persons who already have mild cognitive impairment? Will they still benefit from these lifestyle changes, which may be more difficult for them to implement? You know, actually, we've done some randomized trials with people both with mild cognitive impairment as well as early Alzheimer's disease. And one of my doctoral students uh, had worked on it for a long time. I said, ooh, no, it's, you know, it's hard to make changes. But indeed, both the mild cognitive impairment, we saw changes both in brain health, improving mm -hmm. the brain imaging. We saw changes in their memory, in their reasoning, and in their social engagement. So just think, if we could push off the full-blown Alzheimer's by two years, mm -hmm. the cost-effectiveness of that mm -hmm. is pretty transformative. And there's a word, John, that I came up with several years, years ago, brainomics, which mm -hmm. is the high economic cost of waiting to be right of boom. We always think things too late. If we start left of boom before something bad happens, mm -hmm. you know, diagnosis, then the cost savings is going to be phenomenal. If people have productive lives longer, less caregiving, the brainomics and public policy to start putting our brain and health at the center of our care, mm -hmm. it is a whole new area of care. So absolutely, it's never too late. Right. Impairment, brain change, yes. It is getting late for our panel. So I'm gonna squeeze in a few more things quickly, if I may. What about the role of clinical trials? We all talked about, uh, you know, this is a burgeoning area of research. Um, how do folks get involved in a clinical trial for Alzheimer's disease? Rich, what's your recommendation to folks? Well, um, first of all, I would say um, the only way to achieve state-of-the-art care in the field of Alzheimer's research and treatment is to consider a, tr a clinical trial. Every single person out there, and, and listen, there's there's giving back and, and, and volunteering for research. And yes, that's important. And yes, that's we all should try to do that. But to be very honest, in my clinical practice, every single person, I'm thinking about clinical trials. It's not just to advance research. That's important, don't get me wrong. It's because I'm trying to give that person access to the latest and greatest you know, avenue of care. Granted, there's a 50-50 chance mm -hmm in some trials that they're gonna get a placebo, but even after 18 months or two years, they can still get the called open label where they get the experimental drug and then get tracked. And that's still years before the FDA um, would even review the drug, let's say. So so the take home point here is um, clinical trials should really be considered by all. Um, there's tons of clinical trials going out there, going on. There's there from, from, from amyloid to tau to something I'm passionate about, glucose hypometabolism and using some mm -hmm. maybe diabetes medicines and, and that sort of thing. There's, mm -hmm. there's just so many different options out there from pills to infusions to um, even a cognitive training. For example, if someone doesn't want to take a pill, you can join another study. So uh, please, everyone out there, think about clinical trials um, for yourself and, and for the field. Sandy, what are we going to be talking about as it relates to brain health in five years? We're going to be talking about, oh my gosh, I can hardly wait to see how healthy, how strong, how resilient, mm -hmm. how much capacity I've built. And taking into what Karen's saying, that it's all of us. If we have the cognitive power of every single individual, we can solve the complexity of our world issues. Our brain is, brain capital is the new oil. Let's keep our brains healthy. <laughs> well, that is a good note to end on. And on behalf of Prevention, Healthy Women, and the Women Alzheimer's Movement, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you being here. And we hope you're more informed because you know, better information is going to lead to better health. We invite you to visit yourbrain2021.com to view the entire You and Your Brain webinar series. And finally, we hope you consider making a donation to support the Women Alzheimer's Movement, which funds women's-based Alzheimer's research and educates people about brain health and Alzheimer's prevention. I want to thank our panelists again, who uh, really helped, you know, break it down for us and, and tell us what we need to do and, and what might be on the horizon. So thank you all again. And I look forward to our next discussion.